If you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Psalm 13? We just began a brand new series last week entitled Sheltered, Living in the Shadow of God. We're taking a look at the Psalms. Oh, I love that song we just, we just learned together. That's really the heart of what I want to talk with you about this morning. Boys and girls, we've been talking about confidence this week. And what I want to talk about this morning is sometimes our confidence can waver. Just like David, the author of this psalm, there were some moments in his life where his confidence wavered. But what I want us to see is, just like that psalm declared, it's okay. There are going to be times and seasons in your life, moms and dads, grandparents, teenagers, college students, single adults, that your life is going to go awry. Things are not going to go as you planned, hoped, dreamed, put all of those things in there in the mix together. David writes this incredibly powerful psalm out of incredible desperation. David found himself learning to deal with life's delays. Learning to deal with life's delays is one of the most important things that you and I can learn in our lives. David was at a place where he was simply saying these kinds of words. Maybe you've been there before. Lord, I don't have the strength to go on. Lord, I don't have the confidence to go on. I don't know what I'm going to do. Lord, I am desperate. And David is, appeared to, before he writes his psalm, had been at praying to the Lord and sought the Lord, but it didn't seem to him that the Lord was answering. And now he finds himself in a place of doubt, a place of confusion, and even hopelessness almost. And by the way, I'm so grateful that David wrote psalms like this, and there's many others in the book of Psalms, to help us express our hearts and where we are and how God reacts to what David shares. Let's read together Psalm 13, and we'll dive into some truths this morning. Here's what it says. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest the enemy say, I have overcome him, lest my adversaries rejoice when I am shaken. Boy, there's a, a word you could circle right here, verse number five. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Father, I pray this morning as we dive into your precious word, Lord, I know there are some that are in this building, they find themselves, or maybe even recently, or it might be on the horizon for them. Lord, moments just like David found himself, and we've all been there, in the waiting room of life, when life delays, when things don't go like we planned or hoped, and, and, and things go south, and things go awry, and things and trials and challenges erupt in our lives, usually unexpectedly. And Lord, sometimes it seems like when we pray, they bounce off the ceiling. We wonder sometimes, where are you? God, thank you that you don't fuss at David and you don't tell him that he shouldn't say things like that. But Father, in fact, you invited him to write these words. Lord, words that we can express to you. Lord, Lord words that we can identify with. So Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak truth into our lives. And we come to the time at the end. Lord, our time of response and even invitation. Lord, we would make some powerful choices. No matter where we may be in our lives, we can make these choices as we desperately depend upon you. Lord, as we rest in you. Lord, as we stop all negotiations. That's really what David did. He stopped striving and just simply was still and found out you were God. Speak in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an outline in your seats there you can use to follow along. If you're watching online, joining us online this morning, you can go to PellaBC.com, click that resources tab. You can find those resources there this morning. Have you ever found yourself in the waiting room of life? David found himself there. If you know the story about David, David was anointed as king. And most biblical scholars believe it was some seven, maybe as many as 15 years before he was able to ascend the throne. Maybe even longer. He was living in the waiting room of his life. Meanwhile, Saul was chasing him, King Saul trying to take his life. And he was anxious and afraid and worried and concerned. And he found himself waiting for God's plan to unfold. 
He found himself in the waiting room. You, you ever been in a waiting room, in a, and not to knock on doctors, but any kind of waiting room, maybe at, at the driver's license, that's former before COVID, that was a good thing by the way, wasn't it? Oh man, the driver's license years ago where you almost lost all of your Christianity for those hours that you would wait, right? You, you, maybe in a, in a social security office or somewhere where you had to wait, and you sat there for an hour and you wondered this thought. I wonder if they forgot about me. Did they lose my number? Did I lose my place in line? And then we thought, how much longer am I going to have to wait, right? You've heard that in your vehicle before, right? I know you have moms and dads, that wonderful feeling, right? We had it. We talk about, I can't shake this wonderful feeling. We used to, back in the day, get in a car, right, before we had to wear seatbelts, right? And we didn't have any kind of electronics, TVs, DVD players in the car, God bless my parents. I don't know how they survived, I guess, because they tried to make us go to sleep in the back and lay down the station wagon all the way out. Y'all remember those days back in the good old days, right? And uh, we had nothing to do, right? And so we would ask 30 minutes into the trip, and my children do it now, right? What do they ask? Tell me. Were we there yet? Oh, uh, how much longer, right? We're going to hear those words. Sometimes we feel like that in our lives. We want to say to God, God, how much further is it? How much more can I endure? How much longer is it going to take? That's where David found himself. As he writes this honest point. Maybe you find yourself in a long, drawn-out sickness or a huge financial problem or a long-standing, difficult, tangled, and seemingly hopeless situation you find yourself in. Maybe you have a wayward son or daughter, marriage trouble, an unsafe spouse or friend or family member. Maybe someone that is struggling with an addiction, a child with special needs, a a spouse or a parent dealing with Alzheimer's or dementia or dealing with demanding an unreasonable boss or a jealous co-worker with seemingly no resolution in sight. You ever been there? Some of you are there this morning. An old friend, how God's word has good news for you And for me, I want us to talk about the key of how do we walk through these moments of delay and waiting. Because you see, it's a matter of how we look at them and see them as God's opportunities to do deep work in our lives. When we are at our wits end, without resources, at a loss for a way, perplexed, frustrated, discouraged, and desperate is usually when God is at work the most. Our challenge is, is when things aren't how we want it to be. You see, we pray and we want God to change our situation. But the reality is God wants to change us. We want him to deal with our complications and he wants to develop our character. We want him to change our circumstances, but God wants to change us first. So five things he says in this psalm I want us to look at this morning. Number one is this, David's complaint and his crisis. David starts the psalm in desperation, and then he ends in a powerful declaration. But this this begins with the complaint and the crisis. David's pouring out his heart before the Lord in raw honesty, holding nothing back. I want you to notice, though, as we work through this, as he says these statements, the Lord hadn't changed David's situation. David asked two questions that we ask all the time. I just mentioned them a moment ago. Number one, how long? How long is this going to take, Lord? How long before you answer me? How long until things change? How long until things are going to be different? Psalm 6, verse 3, and there are others you can look at later. Psalm 6, 3 says, And my soul is greatly dismayed, but you, O Lord, how long? Well, when you're having a good time, like on vacation, some of you are about to take this summer, maybe you've already been there, and you look up and all of a sudden it's the day before you're supposed to leave. You've been there for three or four, maybe five days, and the time just seems to fly by. But we're in these moments of delay and waiting. I mean, it is like agony. Sit in a hospital room for four or five hours or for days on end and watch how slowly time grinds to a halt. David asked the question that all of us ask in these moments, how long? The challenge is these moments is it seems in these delays that God seems very far away and Satan can seem so very near. Now that's not truth, but that's the way that it can feel. He asked how long. Secondly, he asked a question not mentioned here, but I believe it's inferred. And here is this, why is this happening? 
Why is this happening? What did I do? Where did I go wrong? Where did I take the wrong turn and should have turned to go to Albuquerque and I didn't go the right direction? Maybe it's something I've done wrong. That's the first question that we a lot of times ask. Sometimes we ask the question of, why is this happening to me, my friends, or my family? The reality is we think in our back of our minds, well, bad things shouldn't happen to me. I mean, I'm a really nice person. I mean, bad things really shouldn't occur in my life. Maybe you're a believer this morning and we have this, this expectation we've placed in the Lord. It's not true, but, but Lord, I've, 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 I'm living for you. And so as a result of that, tough times shouldn't come. Delays shouldn't happen. How long and why is this happening to me? Secondly, there is confusion David has. There is confusion as David puts the next part of his complaint into the prayer in verse, uh, the rest of verse number one that made him feel this way. Two things, his feelings made him feel, number one, that God has forgotten me. God has forgotten me. You ever felt like that before? That God had forgotten you. Not wondering if he had forgotten him really, but more that that David hadn't forgotten God, but that God had forgotten him. Psalm 10 verse 1 talks about this idea this under this confusion or this confession he makes. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord, and why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Lord, it feels like you've forgotten me. Listen, our heart can tell us that, our emotions can tell us that, and Satan will definitely tell you that, that God has just flat out forgotten you, that he does not care. And because he's forgotten you, we may think he's given up on us. But Isaiah the prophet reminded us this is not true. In Isaiah chapter 49, he says this, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but God says, I will not forget you. Dear friends, some of you need to hear this word. Maybe some of you thought God forgot you 10 years ago. But here's a great word of truth and hope this morning. God has not forgotten you. He thought maybe God had forgotten him. Secondly, and maybe even worse, God has forsaken me. David says, Lord, your face is hidden from me. I cannot see you. Other Psalms, 27, chapter 30, chapter 44, even Lamentations, this same thought is echoed. Lord, I feel like you've turned your face. Not only you've forgotten me, but you've forsaken me. You, it feels like you've abandoned me. You've turned your face away from me. You have rejected me, and I find myself. It feels like I am all alone. Listen, the human side of Jesus understood what this is like. Remember, he prayed from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 2. That psalm that is, talks about the cross. It's a messianic psalm. And Jesus says these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to turn his back on his only son because of the sin, your sin and mine, that he had taken on the sin of the world. Jesus understands what it feels like. From the human side to feel like you've been forsaken. But dear friends, David Jeremiah says this quote. God turned his back on his son so that he would never ever have to turn his back on you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 echoes this truth this morning. It says this. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you. We see David's complaint in crisis. Lord, how long and why? We see his confession even further. Lord, I feel like you've forgotten me and forsaken me. And then he talks about his confusion. Some things that confuse us when we're in the delays, when we're in the waiting room. Two things he tells us. Number one is my feelings betray me. David says these words, I take counsel in my own soul. In other words, he was self-talking, right? Ever talk to yourself? Right? Ever work in an office where you talk to yourself and people think you're completely cuckoo? Right? You know, you, you, you talk to yourself, you're trying to convince yourself of what's truth or what's right or what's wrong or how you figure this thing out or how you get out of the mess that you find yourself in and you're calculating how can I get out of this waiting room the fastest? We find ourselves trapped in our feelings and our thoughts and our emotions. Dave was talking about, by the way, that, that, that knot in your stomach. That, that, that lead weight on your chest that we were, for food makes us nauseated. We can't sleep. We can't eat. We can't settle anything. 
Every time we try to get it off of our mind, it comes right back. That gnawing ache inside. Jeremiah reminded us that our hearts will betray us. They'll never tell us the truth about ourselves. The heart is more deceitful than all other, than everything else. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Oh, I love this promise in 1 John 3, verse 20 about our thoughts. And whatever our heart condemns us, our feelings, our emotions, for God is greater than our heart. And he knows all things. You see, the battle is won or lost in our hearts and in our minds. That was his confusion. Secondly, he says, not only do my feelings betray me, my foes assail me. My enemies are fighting against me. Not only does David find himself in the waiting room, but Saul is chasing him down, trying to kill him. An added level of pressure. Lord, I feel like my enemies are going to win. Maybe you feel like in your life, in the situation you're in, that that this person that has spoken evil of you is going to win. Lord, my enemies are going to overtake me. How long do I have to tolerate this? How long do I have to stand in this moment? Lord, I don't want my enemies to overtake me. In fact, that even more. Lord, I'm going to suffer even more. Dear friend, let me remind you of something. You got teenagers. You know this truth. And I was guilty of this as well. You're in that wonderful argument. That wonderful discussion. That's the Christian word for it. It's called an argument. Right? With your teenager. And they always have to have... (laughs) Right? Right? Teenagers, you know it's true. Just, I don't know what it is. Just, if I feel like I can get that last word and I feel like I won. Listen, God has the last word. Not your enemies. God does. Notice this crucial turning point. David begins to pray. What makes the difference? The crucial prayer, how does David go from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, from perplexity to praise, from winter to summer, from sinking to singing? David made a decision to not trust his feelings, to not rest on his emotions, but to step out in faith and keep pleading and calling out to the Lord. He began to focus on what we sung about, that, Lord, you are bigger than I thought you were. You're more powerful than I realized. I forgot when I looked at my problem and my delays, I forgot how huge and massive and awesome of a God you are. See, our delays and our problems and our challenges can make God seem so far away and so small. But dear friend, may you be reminded this morning that God doesn't change. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is ever-present. He prays this prayer. He understands James 4, 8 that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And by the way, this is where the Lord wants us to stay anyway. The problem is, is when things go well, we have a tendency to kind of put on the snooze button. And the Lord wants us to live in daily, desperate, dependent upon Him. Whether I'm in the waiting room or I'm in the highest of heights at Kids Extreme Week. Or I'm in the lowest of lows in a hospital room or in a funeral home or in a waiting room of life. Two things. That David pours out his heart. He says this, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. David pouring out his heart. Because remember, he says, Lord, I feel like you forgot me. Now he's saying, Lord, remember me. He tells him three things. I love this. Lord, number one, I want to see your face. Lord, look at me. I want to know that your eyes and your gaze is fixed upon me. It's kind of like you had those conversations with your little kids, right? You're having a conversation. They get old enough to understand when you say you're listening, but you're really not. And they finally get it and understand it. And they say these words. I love it. Some of you parents are going, oh, I remember that, right? And, and my little ones would grab my face and say, no, 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 daddy. No, no. Look at me. In other words, I want your undivided attention. Listen to what I'm saying. He says to God, God, I need to know that your gaze is fixed upon me. Lord, would you secondly answer me? I need to hear from you. I need to hear your voice. And dear friends, we have God's voice. The enemy would have you put this Bible down and never touch it in moments of distress. 
He would have you say, listen, don't go to church because that's the last place you need to be. People might ask about what's going on in your life. But dear friend, let me encourage you with all of my heart that when times get tough, when delays happen, dive into his word. Get deeper connected to the body of Christ. Don't do the opposite. For that is where Satan does his greatest work. He says to the Lord, Lord, look at me. Lord, would you answer me? I need that word of encouragement. Oh, how we find him in the book of Psalms. He says, thirdly, give me light. Enlighten my eyes. Lord, I feel like I'm going to die. That's how desperate David was. Lord, I need to see light at the end of the tunnel. Notice, though, what he's not praying. He didn't say at this beginning of this prayer, Lord, change my circumstances. He just says, Lord, look at me and answer me. Remember me. And give me light. Secondly, he says, then he finally prays, Lord, rescue me. Don't let my enemies get the best of me. Don't let them gloat or rejoice over my downfall. And here's why David prayed this. Lord, I don't want people to look and think that, God, you're not big enough, yet you're not strong enough to save me. God had made a promise to David he was going to become king, and so he didn't want Saul to overcome him and kill him. Lord, rescue me. And then he ends with the beautiful ending of this psalm. The confident joy. There's that word in verse number five, but. He prays, Lord, would you remember me and rescue me? And then as he looks at the God of heaven and earth, as he looks at that and compares God to his problems and his delays and the waiting room of life, things change. But dear friend, I want you to notice that we rely on the Lord, but we have to make some decisions. We have to make some choices. David makes four important decisions. Number one, he says this. He moves from fear to faith, from questioning to claiming the promises of God. Here's what he says. Number one, I will choose to trust in your unfailing love, in your steadfast love. Now, I love this Hebrew word. It's my favorite Hebrew word. I took Hebrew and Greek in college and in seminary. It was required. And, and so Hebrew was a great language because you got to make like sounds with your throat. It's a very uh, language. And so this word, and you really could almost spit saying it too. I love it. It's the word. You ready for this? Chesed. Right? You got to have the, just like that. That's right. Good. You got to kind of like clearing your throat. It sounds disgusting, right? Let's just talk since half of you are getting to say it. We'll all say it together. Now, listen. We're coming off of COVID, so hold your hand in front of your mouth. I'm kidding. All right, so, so just say chesed. Oh, very well. You have a little Jewish too. That's very good. Miss D, you like that. So pretty good right there. Now, you're going to go out feeling like you've learned something new today. You learned a Hebrew word. Now, here's what this word means. This is awesome. This word stands and means God's covenant love. It is a love that he describes that God says to his people Israel, God says to you and to me, when I grab a hold of you, I will never, ever let go of you. It is not based upon your feelings or your circumstances. It is not based upon how good you are or how bad you are. God's covenant love grabs a hold of you, that steadfast love, and will never, ever let you and I go. Isaiah 63, is this the verse? Let me see this verse. This is the one I want. I've got a couple here. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and his mercy. He redeemed them, lifted them, and carried them all the days of old. There's one in Isaiah that talks about that God grabs with his love, and we're, the, in the, we're imprinted on the palm of his hand. God's covenant love will let you know, never let you go. So I have to make a choice. Lord, I will choose to trust that that is true. That your love never fails. Secondly, I will choose to rejoice in your salvation. Your divine deliverance, right? I will choose to hope in God no matter what, no matter how it feels, no matter how it looks. I will choose to rejoice in your salvation. That you will save me from myself and from my sin, yes. But also salvation ultimately from the circumstances which David found himself in. And the prophet Habakkuk, I don't have time to look here, so I have to look at the last couple of verses. David, uh, sorry, the prophet Habakkuk is giving terrible news. God says to Habakkuk, you've got to tell the people, I'm about to do something they'll never believe. God was about to bring absolute judgment upon the nation of Israel. He was going to take them away, deport them, and Habakkuk is blown away. Habakkuk asks, Lord, why? Why is this going to happen? 
He didn't understand it. But Habakkuk makes a powerful choice to choose to trust in the God of his salvation. Look at what he says in chapter uh, 3, verse uh, thir- uh, 17 through 19. I believe it is, Michael, if we can jump to that one. Here's what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will exalt in the Lord, and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk made a decision. Lord, no matter what happens, I will choose to rejoice in you, the God of my salvation. I will choose to trust in your unfailing love. I will choose to rejoice in your salvation. Thirdly, I will choose to sing because you are good to me. Now, some of you in this verse now, I want you to listen to this verse. Don't miss this verse now. Some of y'all, you need to underline it, triple underline it. It says, I will sing. Now, we sung some songs. We're going to sing another one. Guess what that means you're supposed to do? This is not hard. Sing. I'm all like singing. Well, there's going to be a worship remediation class in heaven you're going to get to take when you first get there because that's where we're going to do a lot of singing. We say in the deep south, singing. Right? We're going to do some worship. What do we sing about? The goodness of God. David began to look back and reflect, and it caused him to sing because he realized how good God had been to him. When's the last time you stopped and paused? And this is hard to do sometimes in these delay moments, these hard moments. The last thing we want to do is look backwards. But we look backwards and we're reminded of God's goodness to us. Dear friend, where would you and I be without God's goodness in our lives? We must choose to trust in the goodness of God. That's why I love that song, The Reason Is You, Jesus. The reason that we sing is because of Jesus. Lastly, as we close, I must wait on the Lord. The first three seem to be easier than the last one, it seems. None of us would choose tomorrow. Let me ask you, I'd like you tomorrow on Monday to go sign up, and this is pre-COVID. I'd like you to wait a couple of hours in the driver's license office. I'd like you to wait a couple of hours at the Social Security office. I'd like you to wait a couple of hours at the doctor's office. Just waste your whole day tomorrow. Anybody like to sign up tomorrow? No. No. But you know what you're deciding in these moments as we close? Lord, I will choose to wait on you. Why? Here's why. Because God sees what you can't see. God knows what you don't know. God has a plan. And part of God's plan sometimes puts us in the waiting room of life. Because there are certain circumstances that have not yet happened that God is orchestrating for your good. There are some people that are not quite ready yet. There are some things that are yet to change. And God has you in the waiting room. Oh, this is such a good word this morning. And you're thinking, Lord, how long? It's okay to ask. Lord, why? It's okay to ask. But at the end of the day, I have to make a choice. This morning as we close, let me ask you this question. For some of you this morning, you need to choose to trust in God's salvation. We've got some boys and girls this week, moms and dads, who made that decision to understand the gospel. They were willing to admit to God they were a sinner, to ask Him to forgive them of all of their sins, to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came and lived and died and rose again for you and for me. To believe it in such a fashion, dear friend, not believe it with my head. That oh, I I believe there's a God. I believe that he is my God. He is my shepherd. He is my Savior. Those are the A, B, and here's the C part, that I confess him as my Savior. I cannot save myself. And today I commit my life to you as Lord. For some of you this morning, that's what you need. You're in the delays of life. Listen, God is using it to try to get your attention. Sometimes God uses waiting and delays and difficult moments to yell at you because he loves you. God will go to the ends of the earth for you to understand his love for you and his desire to have a relationship with you.
For the rest of us this morning, you already know Christ is Savior in you. These four decisions are some that you might need to make this morning. To choose once again today to trust in his unfailing love, even if you don't feel like it. Secondly, to choose to trust in God's salvation for you. And thirdly, that I will choose to sing of God's goodness to me. And lastly, Lord, I will wait. No matter how long it takes, I will wait and trust 